a playlist original. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Blockbuster with your hosts, Gis and Jackson. We got some news to talk about, man. Yeah, it's time to do what we do. And it was been, even though we're dealing with an industry wide strike that is kind of hindering news, we still find stuff to talk about. It's still not, uh, it's still cranking out some Hollywood news. So I'm excited to get into that, what we got today. It really never will yeah. go away. But as you guys have known, both the writers and actors are now striking across the board. But, and that has led to kind of some negative stuff we got to get in today. But it's not all negative because it was exciting crazy weekend of the box office a historic one if i'm if i remember yeah. correctly yeah fourth highest grossing american box office weekend in history yeah we we're both there to celebrate it and we were both we were both, we were both <laughs> as i'm sure many yeah. listeners probably were too. <laughs> we were both there for the event known as barbenheimer well it was so funny because this this all started as like a joke between these two movies because around the same time when like they would announce their like latest cast additions to their cast they're really big ensemble cast like mm -hmm. usually around the same time so it always looks kind of joke it was like oh hey everyone in hollywood is either in barbie or are they in all the time <laughs> <laughs> and then of course when we found out they were coming out the same day that created more of a social media phenomenon craze like, like, yeah it, but like in good in good fun kind of joke it wasn't like so. you know i think in the beginning it was like oh look at these two movies like kind of duke it out and then I feel like the tie kind of changed like within a week or two of the movies coming out where it was like, no, this is like good for the mm -hmm. industry as a whole. If these movies do well. That's and right. I think it helped that like having both movies be excellently reviewed. It wasn't like one shitty movie and one, you know, right. Really good one. You had two really good movies. Uh, you know, even though Barbie is based on like the Mattel line of dolls and stuff, you know, it's still an original story. And, you know, and, you know, we always talk about how we really want original filmmaking out there. We had two That's movies right. that were, that, you know, not Marvel, not comic books. It, it was like, it was just, you know, and not a sequel. That's just, right. You know, it, it's the fact that Barbie and I've never did so well this weekend. Like we've talked about before how like it's really would love to see like really good original movies do well. Absolutely. And I am glad that uh, people went out and actually made uh, both of these movies successful. And it was actually kind of a fun weekend to like kind of watch the numbers as they were coming in 100 because it was, was. Like, was watching every day because it was like so like barbie on thursday it had like a like 22.3 million dollar preview night which was not only the biggest <laughs> preview night of the summer but the biggest preview night of the year and right. you know i i mean we we're going to talk about you saw and i saw barbie i did go on thursday and it was packed it was sold out show and so was mine at uh, oppenheimer and i actually try to find one with my brother be like going through like the AMC app and stuff. I was like, dude, most of these are almost all sold out. It was a really, I, you it know, was I was refreshing. like, what's, yeah, it I was, was like, nice. what's going on here? And then I actually kind of looked at Omnibus too, like going in the AMC app and like a lot of those showings were sold out. So I was like, all right, we have like a nice groundswell, it seems like. And then like Oppenheimer had a really good like preview night too. It was like $10.5 million on preview night. Right. And that kind of voted, voted well because it topped dunkirk's preview night which is like 5.5 million when it opened the thursday and, and then that, it. that's crazy yeah and dunkirk turned a 5.5 million dollar preview night into a 50 million dollar opening weekend so i was like all right this is definitely going to be bigger than 50 million dollars and that is what it was tracking at uh and then more numbers came in it was just <laughs> like by the, by the end of the weekend the original okay the original estimate for barbie at first was 155 million dollars which is a insane amount of money you know, especially for a movie like for that. something like this yeah, yeah yeah for something like this it was a pleasant surprise it wasn't like oh wow i mean it was it was really exciting to see and then the actuals came out and they're like no actually that's a 162 million dollar opening weekend sorry we flubbed the numbers a little bit uh -huh. and in a good way uh and then of course Oppenheimer, like was it 82 million dollar opening that's, weekend? that's right uh, and you know this isn't about like oh barbie slayed that movie they both did so well i mean the fact that like a movie like oppenheimer which is r-rated three hours long right that people Historical came out biopic. for it <laughs> yeah yeah and they came out for it like deadline compared it to almost how you come out for like an event movie like a marvel movie like a comic book movie right that's that was the kind of like numbers and attendance that they were seeing for something like this and i think it just kind of i'll talk about that movie first i think it just kind of solidifies christopher nolan's name alone is enough to generate box office anyone else had directed that movie i don't know opens that well i at all i don't argue with that at all i think 
You're absolutely Me. right. He he passed the test, I would say. And a lot of eyes were on Oppenheimer's opening to see if Chris alone was going to be able to do it. And I think I think he more than than proved that he is able to to lead a box office and, and bring people in just because his name's on the title. More, yeah, more than I mean, ever. I remember thinking that when Dunkirk came out in 2017, because I was like, this is a war movie in the heart of summer. I don't know how that's going to, I mean, hopefully it does some business. But then it was like, he turned that into a $50 million opening weekend. I was like, that guy can open anything. And I guess <laughs> like, this was even bigger test to that. Cause I, you know, it's not on paper. It doesn't really seem like a, a box office sell really. I mean, it like, no, no, you yeah. know, he, you know, he's going to make a good movie. And like, if you're a, a fan of his, you have faith in the fact that he hasn't made a bad movie. Right. Uh, you know, it's been so interesting, like with this movie opening and I'm, I'm watching everyone kind of rank their Christopher Nolan yeah, movies I've and seen that too and i guess the best thing about it is everyone's like well it's no there's no bad thing here it's just like tomato tomato like what do you kind of put ahead of the other like you exactly. know exactly you know i saw some people who had mad love for interstellar it was like in their top you know their top christopher Nolan movie and then you had people who were like kind of frustrated seeing it like further down the list on people's like how is there how is interstellar so low on your list and then I'm one of you those people. people. <laughs> yeah. And then you have people like me who's like, hey, don't forget Insomnia. That's a great movie. Everyone, everyone always forgets yeah. it, but it's there and it's good. So, you know, it's cool to kind of celebrate his filmography and then also to kind of top it off with this huge win for him. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, also, I mean, Warner Brothers had a great weekend, right? Because Barbie did really well. I wonder if they're kind of like side-eyed, like, well, he did really well for Universal. Like, hope we can get that guy back. I wonder, like, I do wonder, like, where he wants to set up, you know, like, you know, this just came out and we if we were talking about like what he does next, but I wonder if he kind of shops around the other studios and he stay with Universal. Well, does he was... kind of like make make up with Warner Brothers? Um, I mean, what do yeah, you do, it's... right? Like he he apparently so after he left Warner Brothers a few years ago, he came to Universal with I guess all these sorts of demands that they honored every single one. And it's like it's hard not to want to honor that agreement. And maybe I would think this could very well be the start of a new relationship, but I'm sure Warner Bros would probably you know grease the wheel a little bit and offer maybe yeah. a little bit more or even any anything i, I would yeah. have trouble believing they'll say no to anything that he asks in order to get him back but i don't know like it, it's a nice fresh relationship everything's been going well with this with this movie it's i don't i really have no insight as to what i think he'll do where he'll go for his next one but safe to say things are looking good in his his relationship with universal so it's great i'm yeah. super happy with how oppenheimer did i was worried actually even though there's a friendly competition at least from like the audience <laughs> side, I feel like Warner Brothers snubbed him a little bit by releasing. Definitely, they did by releasing. Barbie oh, there was. The same I feel like there was definitely some shade yeah. behind the scenes. But <laughs> I feel like the the grander like audience and society didn't let it be negative, and it kind of blossomed into a friendly competition where everyone everyone wanted to see both do well, and the internet did its thing, and you know it's been churning out memes for the better part of a month or two now. Yeah. And but anyway, regardless, it's great to see that they both did well. Yeah. Internet did it sing in a positive way for like yeah, the first time yeah. ever, which is, yeah, I, which is it, it's cool. very refreshing. Something that does it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, most of the time it doesn't, but it was very refreshing to see both do well, both like you mentioned earlier, original projects, give or take, like, you know, the, obviously Barbie has, you know, long, complex IP history and Oppenheimer's based on a book, but still, like you said, not Marvel, big studio temple movies. Like these are, for the most part, original yeah. movies and they both killed it at the box office and like, I, what more could you want as a cinema goer, right? True. I had to, it was funny because, like, one of the features I had to write for Movie Web was talking about how Christopher Nolan actually was in his very own kind of Barbenheimer situation 15 years ago. Because <laughs> The Dark Knight and Mamma Mia came out on the same weekend. And if anything, it's again, like that example in this, it it's a really prime example of how counter programming works, where yeah. you don't want to monop monopolize, like, like in the audience, like you have like, okay, like Oppenheimer is going to skew heavily adult, probably mostly male. Mm -hmm. And that demographic has that. And that was the same way 50 years ago, 15 years ago with the dark Knight, right? right. Mostly male, a kind of broad appeal between young and old, but like, you know, certain demographics going to see that. And Barbie, even though that was cool to see a, a mixed crowd when I went of guys, girls, there was a bunch of, you know, yeah. it wasn't just one way or the other. That is skewing, of course, a bit more female, Young and old, I mean, I mean, there are some, I guess, interesting things that happened where certain, like, more conservative people said they took their kids to go see it and they were disappointed that it wasn't really a kids movie. Yeah, well, you know the I, rating I, before you go in the theater, so yeah, it's like, yeah, I, uh, 
but yeah, uh, you kind of want to satisfy every facet of the audience, and that's what good counter programming does. Right. Where you know you have these like two very opposite movies, and it's like, all right, well, now it's not it's not an issue of like which one does better. It's like okay, there's something for everyone, and now it's just a matter of like how successful will each film be. And you know, 15 years ago, even though of course The Dark Knight had a huge 158 million dollar opening weekend compared to Mamma Mia's 27. Mm-hmm. Mamma Mia had legs throughout the entire summer and made a lot of money domestically and really killed it worldwide. It made like six hundred over six hundred million dollars worldwide. Holy. And of course, you know, the Dark Knight made a billion worldwide. But it it was like you know both movies got to shine. Right. And it's the same thing that's going on with this, where it's like you know it's almost like it's you know some people I guess online that did the the double feature. More power to right everyone that did that. Kind of curious, like which order is a better order to go in like you want like <laughs> residual Oppenheimer feelings while you're watching Barbie or you know the other way around I don't um, know if there is a correct like five hours in the theater is a lot for anybody <laughs> like between the yeah. two movie run times like I'm not sure I well no now neither of us saw both but I'm happy that I saw Oppenheimer first I'm still reeling from it days later I saw it Thursday you're like week. Kid, kid on Christmas <laughs> yeah you're like I, posting like <laughs> that was my <laughs> caption and yeah, it was like, 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 man. Like, almost almost like feature you like being like tee <laughs> like like all excited <laughs> that, that is, I'm a and I do plan on seeing it again but I do I'm sure by next episode I'm sure we plan on both having seen the other film and we can talk a little bit more about both but yes I plan on being back at the theater again to see it again and maybe even three times I saw Dunkirk three times in theaters but twice for sure. Whoa, really? nice. so, yeah. Yes, I did. It was spread out over a couple of weeks, but this one, I mean, it's only every few years you get treated to a Nolan theatrical release. Yeah. So I'm going to take advantage for sure, but I'm very excited for well, you to see it. Cause I had nothing but good things to say. Nice. Well, I, you know, tell everyone, you know, cause we, you know, we talked about it being three hours and all that stuff. <laughs> but like, how did, how did it feel for you? Did it feel like it was lengthy movie or did it like really earn every inch, you know, every, second of its screen i do i mean take my opinion with a grain of salt because i'm speaking very biasly here but uh, i can't get enough a nolan movie so it is a three hour four give me four hours (laughs) i would take it granted i think it was a three hour that felt like a two and a half or 240 so with the pacing is is breakneck and a lot of that had to do with the fast pace editing and but it is very dot i like this sort of thing so this isn't a criticism but it is a dialogue heavy three hour history and physics lesson so if that's your sort of thing Definitely, like at least it's good to know that I would say going in. That being said, the dialogue's fantastic. The performances, although they very much are tailored to complement mm-hmm. Killian Murphy's leading performance, they are all fantastic. There's not a single one that doesn't shine. Really cool to see all these different A-listers pop up in really small roles. You're like, oh, holy shit, that's that's Josh Peck or that's there's Rami Malek, even though they're not in the movie very much. So there's a lot of um, a lot of actors from out of nowhere, all over the place. It's crazy how stacked that cast is, and I'm sure barbie was the same way yeah but what to say about it that hasn't been said every i know it's going to be leading i mean there's really not a category uh that would get nominated in that i don't think it would be leading and yeah. definitely i can see it this is definitely nolan's year for at least another directing nom i i know we're only halfway through the year but i still think he's a front man for that best directing at, um oscar i'm sure i'll get all the technical yeah. noms like there's not a, a single facet of that movie that i didn't think was worth a nomination certainly leading and supporting nominations coming for Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. And then score and cinematography. I would be flabbergasted if they didn't all get recognized at the Academy, but we'll see. But an all around 10, like instant Nolan yeah. classic, not my, I do remember leaving the theater saying this isn't my favorite Nolan movie, but again, that's, that's not really saying much. He's so many of them are fantastic. And I think this fits in his catalog. It's reminiscent of some of his other movies, but not a like, necessarily any of the other works he's done before i'd say it would be the most like down curve just in the nature of the context and the story that he's telling and the grand right. scope of, of this world ending world war ii related narrative but really the yeah. similarities end there but crazy crazy killing murphy performance like i can't wait for you to see it and, and us to yeah everyone everyone's talking him up a lot uh, <laughs> right everyone say everyone's saying a shoe in for a best actor nomination Certainly. Then depending on depending on how, you know, of course we have a lot of movies that are still coming out, but you know, there's always like the early front runner, like, oh yeah, he's got in the bag. And then of course, you know, other movies come out like, exactly. towards the end of the year. Then, so I'm keeping you know. that, you know, for later. It's interesting though, like feels like everyone's kind of 
well, not everyone, but it seems like a good chunk of people are noticing him for the first time. Yeah, I, I saw know. that like over the weekend. I was like, I mean, I'm like, this guy's been putting in good work for a really long time, but like, <laughs> yes, he has. He's, he's never really, I mean, he led something like 28 Days Later, right? But that was like, you know, very, it did well, but very niche horror movie. He wasn't a huge name then. Right. He's mostly, he's mostly just been kind of, of course, you like stuff like PD Binders and all that stuff. But he's yeah, mostly been like a supporting, he's mostly a supporting player in most of the stuff he's in. Yeah. Uh, but he usually stands out. I mean, he's a, uh, you know, even in something like Batman Begins, it's like not a huge part, but he's very memorable in it. And uh, even something, did you ever see uh, Red Eye with him and Rachel McAdams? I'm very familiar with it, but I have not actually seen it. But I know, is that a Wes Craven? Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. He's solid. He's solid in that too. Heard so I mean, about him in that. It's you know, I'm glad that he's having a moment, even though it feels like, hey, everyone should <laughs> be paying attention to him a long time ago. I'm also hearing the same thing about. Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. feels like he said the best thing he's ever done. Uh, he, I mean, I have to argue with that. He's great and stuff. Lot, yeah, a lot of people are saying that you know he is a shoe in for a nomination, and that he, you know, Robert Downey Jr. I think for a, a little bit, you know, do the whole like Tony Stark thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it felt like he kind of like not playing himself, but like an extension. It felt like oh, this feels like very well, much Robert Downey Jr. You know, like, yeah, he was. I, phoning it in for a few years by the end of it. Yeah. And I hear that he completely disappears in this. Like, it's not like you don't feel like it's him. And <laughs> no, that's amazing. Other than the voice. And he's, it doesn't sound like it's just Robert Downey Jr. Speaking like an acting, like if you close your eyes, you can probably tell it's him, but he does a little bit different thing with his voice. But other than that, yeah, he completely, there's not much there to really, uh, it allows you to recognize that it's him. He really disappears. I'd say he even gets a more of a, though he's not nearly on screen as much as Killian, he's definitely a supporting role. He he still gets more of a moment to really give that, that Oscar moment like that. I'm sure if he gets nominated, they'll show on the screen even more so than Killian really does. Killian's fantastic throughout, but kind of maintains the same, I guess, velocity where Robert Downey Jr. is for the most part, pretty honed in killing the role. But yeah. then towards the end, due to the circumstances of the movie, he gets this one moment to really go off. And that is his time to shine and really just elevates his performance a lot. Be surprised if he doesn't get recognized. He was fantastic. But that nice. again, that's everybody in the movie. Matt Damon is one person I haven't really been seeing a lot of praise for. Like just, I just don't see his name brought up, but he's just overshadowed. I think by some of the other performances in the movie, but he was one of my favorite parts. He had some of the, some of my favorite lines and some of the comedic relief in that movie. Benny Safdie too, yeah. a name to look out for a performance to watch for in that movie. He was great as Enrico Fermi. Nice. Yeah, I want that, to ask you this yeah. one thing because like I saw I saw it online. I wanted to know if you like agreed or not. Okay. Um, I saw a few women that reviewed the movie. I guess they spoke. Of, I've never really paid attention to this in a lot of Nolan's movies, but they kind of felt in, in a lot of his movies the female presence is kind of underserved. I guess. Okay. And uh, they kind of felt that way. I guess about the presence of like, especially Emily Blunt and Florence Pugh. How there wasn't a lot. They felt a lot there. And there maybe should have been more there, even though it's not really their movie, right? I mean, it's about him. But yeah. what, I was wondering if you like felt that way at all. Like, does it feel like they're shortchanged a little bit or underdeveloped? I think here's what I'll say. I, I don't know if I necessarily agree one or the other. I will say that while well, acknowledge too that no, it's no secret. Like Nolan's movies are are definitely male performance reliance. And even like I'm thinking of a movie I've seen by him recently. Dunkirk has virtually no women in it, save for a couple extras on right. some of the boats. That being said, I think both Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt, who are virtually the only like relevant female characters in the movie, get an adequate amount of screen time and enough to do relative to like their importance in the story. Like it's pretty much it's established their importance in Oppenheimer's life. I'd say Florence Pugh gets more. I guess she she's probably more of like the character that you're meant to like see the impact on his character of. But Emily Blunt has right. more to do and more time to shine in it. Yeah, I can see that it's it's not any different than maybe any other Nolan movie in terms of like f the female representation. And they're not at the pinnacle or the forefront of the narrative by any means, but relative to their role in in the Manhattan Project and what they're doing in the movie, I think that they're adequately yeah. portrayed. I wouldn't say that it's less than necessary, and I would kind of struggle to think what else they could do other than what Nolan yeah. gave them to do. But I can see why women reviewing the movie might say that, but... It didn't really stick out to me when I was watching it. Yeah, it's great. You know, when I read that, it wasn't something in his other movies that I really paid attention to. 
you know, like right. Uh, you know, I, when I watch when I watch something like Insomnia, like Hillary Swank's character, yeah, it's I guess underdeveloped, but like, I think maybe what she brings, she brought more than like maybe what was on the page, and like you know, more of, it was more of her performance that gave that character a little bit more meat, I guess, than what was kind of written. So I I kind of could see that in something like Insomnia. I guess I guess you kind of feel it in like the Dark Knight a little bit. I mean, I, mean, I don't know how you connect to Rachel. Rachel how, yeah, I don't, if you connect to Rachel as much as you should, like, or even Batman Begins, where it's just like it's like she's just the girlfriend, or just like you know, like is there more to it? Even though I think they do a good job of setting up that you know, and something like Batman Begins with Dark Knight that she's a strong, hardworking woman who cares about her job. Like, you right, get that. But yeah, I guess maybe there could be a little bit more to flesh out and i it's not really something i really like looked at as a detriment though i never really paid much attention like oh like he really does cater more to like the the male demo but in a bad way but like you know it just happens to be like what the you know the anchor of his stories just happen to be men involved like you know at the basis of what he the story he's trying to tell and i don't think that's a good thing or a good or a bad thing one way or another just simply is and i'm fine with that but yeah no i mean i wouldn't uh, as a woman looking to go see female heavy narrative i wouldn't necessarily point you in christopher nolan's direction to put it lightly yeah. but i don't think his movies True. suffer for that but uh well ladies if you want a female <laughs> heavy representation yes. the other end of the other end of the spectrum you have barbie which Tell is kind of funny that. that you t- yeah you're talking about like oppenheimer with the oscar conversation this is by the way Big box of big box of for both movies really helps the Oscar chances a lot. It's like, oh, they're successful financially, and that's like a good look. And I think, you know, for the Oscars too, if you know, if they do get represented there, you're gonna have two very popular movies showing up at the Oscars, which is kind of like what people want sometimes from the Oscars. So they're like, yeah, sometimes sometimes stuff gets nominated and they're like, I've never seen women talking, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> where it's like, where can I where can I find this movie? In the case of these two really popular titles and very different movies but like barbie is going to be in that conversation too i think i think greta gerwig that you know the fact that she successfully landed this and landed it so well is a testament to her talent as a director and then you know of course her writing part noah bombeck as well they both uh created like a really smart it's funny like on the surface level stuff's really funny yeah, uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, I, I actually dug the. It has a lot. It does have a lot to say about women and a woman's role in the world. As it should. And, I'm not expect anything less. Right. I mean, I don't know if you kind of seen it online, but America Ferrera, who uh, she plays someone that works for Mattel, and she has a daughter, and they kind of like are like the heart of the movie, where you know her mm-hmm. and her daughter aren't really like connecting that well, and they kind of connect through this kind of you know shared experience of helping barbie while she's in the real world and all that stuff okay and america Ferrera has a really well written very well acted monologue about what it's like to be a woman okay you know in the world and you're gonna get a lot of dudes who are like oh that was so heavy-handed but every bit of that monologue is so true though and okay. i think that's i think that's what you kind of have to take from it like i i have seen like some men kind of attack the movie like oh you have to like beat us over the head with like your feminism but <sighs> you wouldn't have to if like women weren't in a position where they do have to explain themselves and work harder and like you know, it's just true and some right. you know, walks of life and they wouldn't have to say that if you know that didn't exist you know if that wasn't and, reality and, right and, yeah that wasn't reality yeah so you know i i respected what she did with it and i thought it was really smart it, i mean it kind of i didn't really so <laughs> I, you know, of course, I didn't grow up playing with Barbies, and I don't think you did either. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, <laughs> but, not, I, you know, they're so present in my youth for sure. But like, I never paid attention to the fact that you know, and they kind of make fun of it a lot. Like, they what Barbie and Barbie Land and all the Barbies and Kens, they think that they've made things better for women in the world because you know, in Barbie Land, Barbie can be a doctor, a lawyer, she yeah. can be an astronaut, she can be anything that she wants to be. And she gets, she's like in for a rude awakening when she goes to the real world and uh, she's not appreciated in the way that, you know, she thinks she would be. She's more objectified because she's a woman. And it's funny too, because like in Barbie land, Ken is kind of like, I didn't know this about Ken, like, you know, lore at all. Cause I'm of course (laughs) didn't play with Barbies or Ken, but 
you I've never paid attention to the fact that I guess like you know that Barbie has a dream house in a car, but they're like, what does Ken do? And like they really don't like have any backstory. He just beach. He's that's just it. Ken. And they yeah. kind of make <laughs> <laughs> and they make fun of that a lot. Where like Ryan Gosling, by the way, MVP of yeah, the movie. Margot Robbie's pretty good. good. I can't wait. Yeah, Margot Robbie's very good, and she bounces. She bounces like the broad humor and like the more kind of touching, vulnerable stuff really well. But Ryan Gosling went full one hundred percent committed. I mean, you can just tell that he had a lot of fun. I mean, they all did. Everyone involved looks like they had a lot of fun doing it. But like, it's just funny, like what he kind of realized his role when he goes into the real world. He's like, wait, they respect men here because they don't really respect Ken and Barbie Land. Like, there's kind of like Ken's just there to kind of hype up barbie that's what right his presence is uh but yeah they do a lot a really good job of kind of poking fun at that there was one line that i felt so bad laughing at it but it was just so uh-huh. funny like she goes she goes to mattel and she like wants to talk to like the ceo who she thinks is a woman and will ferrell's like i'm ceo and you're like all right what, what about the they're like what about the cfo and then like another dude and she's like she names like another position and they're like wait that's all men like women don't run mattel and she was like, come on, there has to be like some kind of woman in like that works here. And one of the guys raises his hand. He's just like, Well, I'm a man with no power. Does that make me a woman? And I was like, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and it's just so on the nose. You almost felt bad yeah. laughing at it, but it was like, <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> See, I haven't heard like much of like of the actual like jokes like verbatim yet. So like I really don't know what yeah. to, I've heard that it's funny. I've also heard from numerous sources some jokes kind of fall flat which is to be expected in yeah i mean comedy but any comedy no yeah, doubt yeah. there's going to be good ones i'm ex- i am excited for the humor because i've only seen one greta gerwig project and granted it was it had some humor in it but it wasn't it was ladybird i wouldn't necessarily label it as a comedy first so i am excited to see what kind of even though it's i guess it's noah bombach written but uh co-written yeah did they both did they both write you know yeah they both wrote it okay, yeah they well, both wrote it. in any case yeah, yeah i am excited to, to see what kind of humor i'm in for i would expect a lot of it is like a social satire and has a lot to do with like women and men's place in society so i'm expecting kind of like that kind of humor but as for what yeah. exactly the nuances i am still very much looking forward to if it's going to make me laugh and which sort of ways yeah. but like that's an example of a great joke actually yeah it was, it was i was dying dude like the whole theater like <laughs> erupted when that line came out i was like but you almost feel bad laughing i was like oh well Right. I mean, well, well, you know, that's a good job of any satire. Well, does does it come yeah. across as a satire or does it come across? Because here's something. It's that, very like tongue in cheek. Like, I mean, okay. you can really tell that, like, yeah. But I like that it was tongue in cheek, but there was also like a realness to it, too, where there was a message. And I know that might sound cheesy to some people listening, but there had something to say, too, which right. makes it better than just being like a one joke kind of movie. And I, that's what I respected about it. I mean, of course, it's coming from Greta Gerwig, so I knew there'd be more to it than just like, there have to be some kind of underlying like message and theme and like yes um yeah, i feel like people I, are surprised at like didn't expect that sort of thing like because although i've seen criticism of the movie like i've seen from the people that i follow regularly on like youtube for instance that, like the people that i watch reviews of like it's been pretty split on the people that i follow men and women alike but i feel like yeah. people are surprised that it had the message that it did it's like were you not a, sort of expecting this to to be what they were going for like I guess some people right. weren't ready what they were trying to say with this movie, but I'm kind of fully expecting, and I feel like that's going to benefit my experience. I'm not kind of surprised that I've seen some of the negativity that I have seen, but the praise that I've seen for the movie, it makes me excited yeah. to, to see it still. Like I'm not turned off yet, but I yeah. was surprised that it wasn't across the board. That being said, I did see criticisms for Oppenheimer as well, not to necessarily compare them, but uh, still I'm, I'm very much looking forward to add to the discourse, I guess once yeah. i do see it which hopefully will be this week yeah oh and by the way guys i love that if you're gonna give the one f-bomb to someone in the movie give it to Issa ray so i just want to say oh, that okay. if you've seen the movie it's a very well dropped f-bomb Perfect. good comedic <laughs> timing caught me off guard dude i was like whoa okay <laughs> but, but you know like if you if you're familiar with Issa ray a little bit she's got she's got some sass and she was able to like <laughs> drop it in like the best way possible nice. so it was like it was pretty like my my brother, I like had actually had like a guttural like laugh to it because it comes out of nowhere. Uh, it was it was great, and you know, I we talked about Margot Robbie, we talked about Ryan Gosling, who have been getting the obvious praise. The whole ensemble is very good. They all like Simu Liu has like some really funny stuff in it too. He has okay. really really funny stuff with Ryan Gosling. There's there's some there's some song and dance stuff in it, yeah. which it, it worked for me. It was funny. Okay. <laughs> I mean, 
Ryan, I mean, another example of Ryan Gosling just going for it. Uh, I also love like someone like him at this point in his career where it's like, it seems because, you know, he's done comedies before. Like you talk about the nice guys and like crazy, stupid yes. love where, you know, he's done comedic stuff. I think for the most part, he's kind of viewed as like a very serious actor. Like a lot of his stuff is very, I'd say his filmography reflects that definitely leans drama. heavy, right. And yeah. I love you, know, that. You, get, <laughs> you get more like blue Valentine than like chuckles. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but it seemed like he kind of, just the interviews he's done for the movie, it seemed like he really like opened up a part of himself for this. And I was like, hey, okay. I should probably loosen, I should like loosen up more. And you know, I, I guess he was in really, really encouraged by Greta Gerwig to do it because she really wanted him. That was like her only choice for that part. Okay. And and because she, I, it. yeah, and what she said to in interviews, because you know, we were talking about this a little later, like the actors aren't, they did all their promotion for Barbie early, like because they knew the strike was kind of coming and they wanted okay. to get. Thinking. everyone out like everyone out to interview but like the last week it was mostly just credit gerwig promoting the movie and it makes sense but she said like what's good about ryan gosling is that there is he's funny because he comes from the jokes with the jokes from like a real place like he he wants to know like the meaning behind the joke and why is it funny and he like and that's kind of like what she said he did with that part he okay it was she said he was he she said it was he was so funny in this because he took it seriously it, okay. he didn't really take it he didn't really take Ken to be like dummy like he really kind of came at it I'm like no i really want to understand this dude and i think that's why and i think that's why it works because he is like fully invested in like you know who this guy was and it kind of you know on paper his role doesn't really have a lot that you know that margot robbie says where there's like layers but right. i don't think that's the point i don't think that's the point for his character i mean like it's he definitely is certainly there, I mean, there's comedy everywhere, but he is constantly the comedic relief. There's no, like, a lot, there's no, like, real, the serious moments that he does have are kind of, like, layered with comedy, because it's very overdramatic, because he, yes. like, he, you know, kind of like this, like, woe is me, like, like, look at me, I'm Ken, like, what do I have? Yeah. All I have is, all I have is beach, and I only know you, Barbie, I don't, how do I exist without you? That kind of existential crisis, that's what he's going through. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can see it being fun. Yeah, so he has to play, you know, most the jokes and like, you know, like I, you said earlier, you said some people said that all the jokes don't land because like, but that happens with comedies it's where it's like, expected. yeah, but I would say for the most part, it really uh, does. And I, you know, I guess the cool thing about this, if it does get some Oscar love, it'll be, it's, it'll be nice to see like a comedic film kind of get represented at the Oscars. So that's not, that that's is rare. Not yeah, that is rare. Uh, and I think he's a shoe in for a nomination. Donnie, who's actually been on the show with Mm. a lot in the past and you also use on the screen with, with us he thinks it comes down like right now like for a win between gosling and downey jr he saw both movies okay, uh, nice. and, boy, Don. and he, he was like while i think the ryan gosling performance would be more fun to see win he he's putting his uh right now his all his money on downey jr yeah. downey jr yeah awesome uh but you know he but it's still i mean having even having comedic performance and nominated like that would be nice to see Margot Robbie, I guess it depends on how crowded the the lead female category okay. is this year. Uh, this this thing is definitely going to kill it at the Golden Globes. I mean, I feel like this is that was cater cater made for them. Like I can just see that sure. you know sweeping a lot of, like the comedic you know awards there too. Production design is amazing. I mean, it's a hundred and forty five million dollar movie. I didn't know this until I looked up like how well it did at the box office. I was like, I wonder how well it did relative to his budget i mean it opened over its budget right. but i i was surprised that it was that big but then when you look at the movie and the like the scope of it it you looks see. like all that a lot of money <laughs> yeah yeah making making that world legitimate and real and authentic pink everywhere man <laughs> yes. I, I, I wouldn't expect it unless all over the place it's and really cool. in contrast it is oppenheimer because oppenheimer oppenheimer is all grays and blacks and dark tones it's, yeah it's hilarious how much they stand in contrast to each other but the production design is another fantastic element of that too it's something that they both excel in no doubt you can tell just from the trailers yeah and also when it, you know talked about records you talked about the fourth uh biggest weekend at north american theaters yep uh above and beyond the biggest opening weekend for a female director too so kudos to yes. Greg on that as Certainly. well I guess before this, it was Captain Marvel, which was co-directed by a man and a woman. Oh, I don't but, know. That and that was, that was like, had like a $155 million or $54 million opening weekend. And that was like the biggest one 
opening with a female director, but uh, I suspect Greta Gerwig will have this be the record holder in this for a very long time. I mean, and <laughs> I say I say that I know it's because I I really hope that genuinely opens the door to be like, hey, like give female directors big studio movies they can do bang up job with them um and i hope you'll see more of that i think hopefully her success with this will lead to studios being like oh yeah you can guys can do this too it feels like a strange thing to say but like that's how hollywood kind of works they they need like an example Example, of like oh look look at what happened all right well we'll give you another one once something makes money then i'm sure they'll be way more likely to throw their weight behind you know change so hopefully this will be the one that you know opens opens the doors for for other female directors yeah and you know it's cool margot robbie i guess when she because barbie was in development hell for a really long time i think as you know like at one point it had another writer attached like diablo cody was working on it and then that's when it involved like amy it involved amy schumer back then she was oh, supposed God. to be the lead, oh, and I think God. the movie. As, yeah, 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 I know. I felt her. And I think the movie, as we see it now, is completely different from what they kind of pitched and sold before. Yeah. Uh, but Margot Robbie, I guess, in her pitch meeting with Warner Brothers, and probably seemed like a silly thing to say then, but when you look at the numbers now, it's like, all right, what she said makes sense. She pitched it to Warner Brothers, like, hey, this is like Jurassic Park level big. Like she sold it, like this is how big it can be. And again, it probably sounded silly then, but then you look at the numbers from this weekend, you're like, oh, well, she's not wrong. No. <laughs> uh, she, they, you know, it's crazy to me, like, to see, like, a marketing blitz like this to work and not realize, like, how does it not work all the time? Like, whatever the most that they did to market this movie, like, they did all the right things. They got, they got all the stars out promoting it ahead of time. I think having some of them jump on the Oppenheimer Barbie train too helped as well, where they're Certainly. like, hey, like, go support their movie. And they're like, Hey, no, yeah. And Killian Murphy's an interview saying like, yeah, I'll go see Barbie. I love all those people. I think that helps. It's a weird way for both Absolutely. movies at the end of the day. And I, I know I, it's really cool to see. I don't like it's imagining her being in that meeting. And I wonder like what the executives kind of felt like when they left, like, okay, okay Jurassic Park. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, then, and then now probably as of end of day Sunday, they're probably like calling her and praising her like, Oh, you were so right. <laughs> um, I'm sure they're glad they listened to her because, yeah, who could not look at that that opening and not, you know, be overjoyed, especially as a studio exec. Yeah. Now the big question is because I think, um, I think worldwide it opened to like a little over like 300 million worldwide. Um, uh, okay, Barbie. Yeah. I was to say, I know between the two, oh, of yeah, them, well, yeah. like over yeah. half a million, over half a billion. Sorry, but I haven't seen the individual yes. worldwide numbers yet. So the big question is, do you think Barbie can be a billion dollar global Ooh. earner at the box office? I'd say like it's on track. I guess we'll have to see what kind of legs it has. I can't remember who I saw. Someone was breaking down like which movie will have more legs. And I think they decided Oppenheimer would. I really don't know. Having not seen it, I'm sure a lot of people flock there to see it opening weekend for the hype for the, the Barbenheimer opening yeah. weekend, you know, the to be part of the the cultural just event, the phenomenon of it. Hard to say now. I don't really don't know what to expect. I definitely think it has the potential. I don't know if I feel one way yeah. or another that it will. I I know there's nothing else really right now that is in that discussion. What about uh, right. Dead Reckoning though? Is that approaching that? Did that? How did that do at the box office this weekend? Did these two movies just absolutely kill that. Well, do you have any idea? It's, you know, it's interesting too because we because we didn't have uh, we didn't talk news last week. We just, you know because we did the Dark Knight right. stuff. And um, I, I had been wanting to talk to you about the box office for Dead Reckoning because I don't know if you noticed, like, when it opened, Variety ran two stories about its <laughs> opening weekend box office that was saying basically it underperformed when it opened, like, domestically. And then also had a story about how it killed it because of, like, overseas, like, its international grosses. So right. they were selling two different ideas of, like, how the movie did. One where it's, like, kind of like, oh, like, Tom Cruise didn't really save this one, and another being like, "Oh, like look at how well this did because of him." And they were, I, I think they were trying to like. It seemed like they were trying to appease anyone that was like that might be reading their site that day. Right? <laughs> yeah. I do remember seeing a post um, I think you made about it. We hadn't really discussed it, but I did see that from you. Yeah, I. It's crazy because I thought this would be a billion dollar movie for sure globally. And it's um, it's at like three hundred. It's at Ooh. yeah. It's at three hundred seventy million worldwide right now. 
domestically yeah, it's made 118.6 million. It had like a pretty steep fall this weekend, but I thought that was no kind, of, kind of to be expected with like yeah. the two new movies opening. Yeah, it fell 64.6% from its opening weekend. I think it might be able to level off, you know, a bit weeks ahead, but I don't really know what to call it yet. As I think uh, I look, like a flop or success. Yeah, I mean like I kind of want to see what it does more like once more international grosses because like this franchise like I saw when we were breaking down uh trying to see what open to when I was reading the numbers for like the last two Mission Impossible that even you were shocked at like how much of a majority of his grosses comes from like overseas. That's right. And yes. It's it's always kind of been more of a kind of international player. So like, I guess kind of gotta wait and see. I'm sure it had a really weird release pattern, right? Because it opened midweek. Yeah. That's- like at, and like we talked about, that was mostly to take advantage of trying to have the IMAX screens as long as it could because Oppenheimer has them for three weeks. So and kick kick their record right out. Right. Um, It'll get that last week of IMAX again, but uh, those numbers dropping, like who knows if that's going to really yeah. make a difference. I will say, I think because if you took the three day opening weekend, it was like 56 million, a little bit over that, which was on paper short of what Fallout did, which was like 61 million dollar opening weekend. Okay. But, you know, Fallout didn't open on a Wednesday, you know, a much very different release pattern. I think if Dead Reckoning had a standard three day opening, the opening would have been bigger mm-hmm. instead of it being stretched out across, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, I mean, they had to do what they had to do, right? Because they did want to take advantage of having the the IMAX screens as long as they could. Right. But I think opening midweek is, I mean, especially when it's not week, like kind of holiday opening. It's not like it was 4th of July or anything like that. It right. really was kind of a strange like release pattern. for it. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's too early to call right now. Certainly we can is. at least agree it's not going near a billion. <laughs> so I was surprised by that. But yeah. No, I have seen this kind of discourse online about uncertainty as a whether like you know quite the degree of success that it's had in the box office but i hadn't really taken the time myself to, to go look at the numbers but lower than i would have expected certainly this far after its release uh, which is disappointing because i expected a higher but not necessarily disappointing in the fact that it's a dismal box office performance by any means but i'm sure right. yeah another couple of weeks will give us more of a clear picture but to get back to your question I'd rather see Barbie before I really predict if I think it'll hit a billion, but certainly I'm sure movies have opened a less and have still crossed that threshold. So time will tell, but do you, do you feel one yeah. way or another? I think it has some gas in the tank to do it. I think yeah, it doesn't have like a ton. I mean, this is the case for both movies, right? There's not like a ton of competition incoming. I mean, you have stuff like talk to me and haunted mansion, but like a lot of the bigger movies have already opened. That's right. uh, so, I mean, so I really, it has a chance to kind of just like, hey, it's one of the only games in town kind of thing. So like, hey, this right. is like what everyone's <laughs> yeah. choosing to see. I think it's the kind of movie that will get repeat viewings as well. I think it has that kind of where You're people right. will go see it more than once. Again, like you said, you want to see it for yourself before making like a total judgment on it. But I, I think it has a chance to do it. Okay. And and I'm sure, I mean, we talked about how this was a great opening for or a great weekend for, you know, movies not tied to like a comic book or a sequel or anything like that. But I can imagine the Warner brothers is like, uh, so can we get another one? <laughs> like <laughs> I, I'm sure that's probably already. And I, and I think all involved are willing to do it. That it, it going. on any sort of note that it, it could have a sequel. No, not really. I mean, it kind of, I didn't it, get that. Vibe. I want to give it a there. If, if Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach had a really good idea to write something where you, there was a good reason to go back into that world, I would, be yeah, invested in it. I can see yeah. it working. You know, I don't think that sh- they would do it unless they really had a solid idea to revisit right. it. But I think conversations like that have already happened where it's like, okay, where can we take this again? Just kind of mm-hmm. like internally amongst like, you know, behind the scenes people and Margot Robbie and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if they want, I'm pretty sure, I mean, Warner Brothers needed this win, by the way, because they're, they're coming off a very, dismal flop in the flash which is going to cost them yeah. about 200 million dollars who know who knows is what's going to happen with blue beetle that entered tracking at like 12 to 20 million dollar opening weekend and that is not oh, good man man and, i didn't hear that shit and and i feel bad because i and i guess it's a good way to kind of segue into this like mm. act the actress can't promote 
the stuff because of the sax rate. Right. So I think blue something like Blue Beetle would benefit from its stars being out there to promote it. I know that right. they said that Warner totally. Brothers thought about delaying it and they decided against it. And just I think I hate to say it, but I think they were just like, let's just get it out there. <laughs> and I, I mean, this is like it is, what it is. like that's the approach I would take if I'm in their shoes. Like they really need to before they kill their new universe before it even gets here, they need to wrap up what's left of the DCEU. Last movie did yeah. not do anything for them to kind of prove that, or at least maybe not prove, but at least offered a glimpse into the state of their fans right now and how on board they still are with these now old regime DC stories before the new universe comes out. I feel like they are best just getting these last two releases out in front and see how they do and rake up as much money as they can from them and then kind of close that chapter. So I don't blame them. I don't think it's also, it's a first time character. I don't think we've seen any sort of blue beetle theatrical yeah. or even like, mo- like not, really, um, not really a well-known character no. for Kenzo I had never even heard of like, I mean, I'm not a comic book either. aficionado by any means, <laughs> but I had never heard of this character before. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. So definitely not something I don't think they can really count on bringing them a whole bunch of dollars, but no, I mean, wanted to do well, but I, I don't agree with, you know, I think it's probably the better move just to get it out and then trudge all the way to Aquaman 2 and, and get that one in the rear well, view. Uh, I mean, did, you, did you see that story that the Hollywood, Hollywood Reporter ran about Aquaman 2? And mm-hmm. If I did, I can't it's, remember. It, it's had multiple reshoots. They had two or three test screenings that were really bad, which led to like more reshoots. Uh, this they I had, heard, like, yeah. They had two different Batman cameos. They had Michael Keaton in one, Ben Affleck in another. They cut both of those. So you could tell how they, you could just tell like, and I guess the cut that they have now, Warner Brothers is more pleased with it, but it yeah. sounded very much like, like we're not like it's great, but like more pleased than what we've seen before. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what so that's a low uh, fucking bar, man, for this movie. Yeah. So between Blue Beetle and that, I mean, I kind of agree with you in the sense it's like do you just gonna like wash your hands of like let's just get these out there and like yeah be done i do feel bad for blue beetle though because i mean there's there's a lot of you know representation is important you have like a comic book movie that's being led by like that's you know actor that would have been for great for that movie time? to really be successful am i wrong first time yeah, and yeah like that's yeah, great no, yeah so yeah you're right and that's great and like it's the timing of it is unfortunate because very much strike. So. I think um, in another world, this movie could actually have had a pretty decent performance. Like there could be a lot of interest in it, but circumstances are just not really shaping up that way right now, which is disappointing for, yeah. for the movie and anyone who wants to see it do well. So I'm with you. Yeah. So I mean, to come off the really fun, good industry news with this like very lucrative <laughs> box office weekend, which again, back, both again, both movies both should be very proud that they did very well. Um in other news, uh, the industry itself is pretty much shut down because, uh, like we said on our last news episode, like there was a pending screen actor skilled strike, and then that became official. And now they're on the picket lines along with the writers. Uh, I think what we've kind of seen since the SAG strike started is a lot of ugliness kind of within the industry. That's, uh, I mean, seeing some of these stories where they're talking to these execs of course anonymous because they don't want to give their names uh-huh. where in the case of the writer strike um some of these execs are apparently like hey we can wait them out because eventually they're gonna lose their apartments and like all this like very like ugly like they're gonna need money so we right. can like wait it's them out dirty. i have friends who are messaging me they're like that aren't even in that industry and they were like you're really seeing like a real ugly side. So like, you know, as, as much as we love movies and talking about them and going to see them and like, this is like a, you know, we also like love actors and like, you know, love being entertained. Yep. Well, like with the profession, there is also a really bad side to it. And I think we're seeing the really greedy bad side of it. And I'm not talking about in regards to like the actors or writers. I'm talking about studios, CEOs, executives, the people Ooh. that finance these things. I think yeah. This has been a moment to see their true colors. And it didn't really take long for when things really hit the fan and for the strike to actually come into full swing. Did they pretty much instantly uh, outed their plan and their, and their true colors, like I said, and like mentioned, it all comes down to that one exec. And I'm sure many of them shared this approach into just waiting for them to starve before they expect them to fold. Yeah. But 
I'm really hoping that the actors stay resilient because they're not the only ones that are going to be losing money. Studios are going to have nothing in production, nothing to put out the longer this goes on. And for some of them, I say good riddance. Like this is going to be a huge wake up call, I hope. And hopefully this will have historic implications for, for the industry because something needs to change. It's no secret. Things have been going in a very bad direction and have been remaining stagnant. And eventually, you know, the, something's gonna, the cookie's got to crumble. And I don't feel bad yeah. for when it does come down to these studios, you know, not having anything to put out and when their productions maybe fold, it's going to suck from the artistic side of things. And for all these people that have been working on this stuff. But if that means that these greedy corporations and these, for lack of a better term, like horrible execs that have been saying these sort of things, losing money, they don't have a single bit of my sympathies. Yeah. One of the, one of the really crazy things, I mean, there's a ton of crazy things because they actually, <laughs> yeah. people from the Screen Actors Guild actually like release kind of like, you know, they have like what they were kind of suggesting what they wanted and whether or not the people that represent the studios either rejected it or like whatever. And, you know, they, it was clear that they rejected their offer when it comes to residuals about streaming. They didn't yep. want to budge on that. And that's going to be a big sticking point. Then there's this AI thing, which um, I don't know if you heard this one, but the one that really got me was that they want, you're a background actor. Like mm. they wanted to be able to, okay, get paid for this one thing, your background, this one movie or TV show. They want to be able to kind of scan your likeness and then be yeah. able to use it in other projects without Forever. paying you for yeah. using, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for their likeness. And I can't believe they actually I, thought that was going to be agreed upon. Yeah, and some of the some of the actors and even writers that saw that deal were like, yeah, because they they keep saying like, oh, we gave we offered them like historic historic significant bump, and they were like, yeah, this is part. They were like, this is part of that historic uh, bump they tried to give us. Like, look at all this fine print, and like that is that's crazy that you would want to not pay someone for using their likeness that you could just use it over and over again as much as you wanted to and any project you choose to work on in the future. Um, it's almost comical, like how out of touch those people are. Was it was yeah. it David Zaslov or Bob Chapek that said that the industry's like reaction and like their demands are like disturbing to him or whatever for like what they're asking. Do you remember who said um, that? I think Bob Iger said Iger, something about Chapek, yeah. yeah. Bob Iger. And, and like, it was funny because like, used to think he was like the nicest of the ceos but then he, then he, made, then he made that comment yeah i was like Give me about a fucking break this almost like this is like an inopportune time because like, you know we're just getting over like what the pandemic did to the industry and like we're just trying to recover and swell thing to hear from you when you make 27 million dollars a year exactly. i mean it, just, it was so it's just so tone deaf it's and like exactly what it uh, is and i don't i don't see like in an interview you can actually like in his position say that like i guess like you're that rich and that out of touch I guess I, that's I, like, <laughs> the stereotypes I mean, are true it's clearly we've seen this for ourselves for at least like for me and for probably many people i would imagine like for the first time it's not often that like if you don't work in the industry or adjacent to the industry that you really see behind the curtain on those sort of elites so like this is i don't other than small little promotional quotes and stuff i don't really see a whole lot of interaction from like people on of Bob Iger's status or David Zaslov status. Yeah. Um, actually just speaking candidly about things that are not related to like movies per se. I guess this is related to stuff happening in the industry, but to have seen him say that and some of the other execs, their quotes about their thoughts on what's going on. It's like disturbing to quote him. Yeah. It's like ridiculous. Like you said, tone deaf, how do you imagine that somebody who makes tens of millions of dollars can complain about, dishing out like literally it's we're talking about 0.217 percent of a studio's net worth would satisfy yep. the demands of, of the guild like it's ridiculous that they won't succeed yeah uh, like we've said before i know we've mentioned this when we talked about the writer's strike the one from 2007 and 2008 how some of us still have ptsd about how it ruined some of our tv shows uh that wave well, is coming. gonna ruin is now now it's like it's gonna ruin some of our movies uh <sighs> we'll to get the first one out of the way only because it's coming out first i don't I, this is not the most important one but this was a it's the first official delay because of the strike our little zendaya sexy time tennis movie is not going to come out until spring 2024 because of this it's directly related to this they were mm. supposed to have a big splashy premiere at the venice film festival but since the actors cannot promote anything that's not happening anymore 
And this uh, Venice Film Festival remind us is this September when that kicks September, off? Yeah. September. So yeah. yeah. So it's it's disappointing that even though it's kind of just around the corner now, but they're definitely both I think the studios and those striking pretty confident that there will be nothing close to a resolution by that time, which is very disappointing. Yeah. But uh, and if you're wondering, push. yeah, and if you're wondering too, why can't they just release it and like kind of wing it? And people will go see it based on who's in it. They broke it down that like Zendaya has a huge social media following and they were saying that the trailer for challengers got like 156 million views in its first 24 hours, which was oh. the, it, it was the biggest viewed trailer for an original movie this year that wasn't tied to like another IP or a sequel, anything okay. like that. Nice. So they need yeah. her to sell the movie. Right. Like, <laughs> I mean, like she, I mean, interesting too, because I, one of my friends was like, people really care like about actors going out on talk shows and talking about movies and like promoting their stuff. Hmm. It does, it does help get the word out there, especially in, like a movie like this, where like, uh, the person in question who's leading it has a younger following and they will pay attention to that. Right. And they'll pay it. They'll pay attention to like what she's wearing on the red carpet or like, you know, like that sells the, even that sells the movie even more so than her just doing interviews about the movie. So that promotion is important. Um, it sucks because I was really looking forward to that movie. Me too. Um, and, but now this could actually affect another Zendaya project, <laughs> which right. is, which was this was the one, and this is not official yet, but right. they're thinking Still about not yet. It. Yeah, maybe by uh, the time this comes out, it will be, but hopefully not. Yeah, as you know, you know, Jax and I are really looking forward to Dune Part Two. It's, it's still coming out in November so far. So far, but, but Warner Brothers is really looking to for thinking of moving it 2024. Same thing so. with thinking about, which is crazy. If they're even thinking about it with Aquaman, which has already been moved around on the release schedule oh, so many times. Who cares? Just get it out. And and they're thinking about it with. Color Purple, which is going to be their big kind of Oscar baby musical that right. was coming out in December. Oddly enough, they didn't say this about Wonka, which is also Warner Brothers. I assume I'm assuming that would be in the same spot too. Uh, yeah, they have three December releases, don't they? Yeah, I was like, when I, when I looked so at it, I was like, when I looked at it, I was like, why are you guys trying to like kill your own projects? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> competing with each other, you know? It's would... like it's like some. It's like some intern made a mistake and put them on the wrong dates or something. Like yeah, no, honestly, it does feel like some oversight. But actually, now that you mention that, now it almost kind of does make sense to push Aquaman too. That's not the movie that's going to be making them any. Yeah, we we don't care about that one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> like to speak candidly, like I feel like they should kind of prioritize, you know, Color Purple and Wonka, especially as they're just not tied to the fledgling DC EU. And it, right. does it really matter when Aquaman 2 comes out? Like, I don't really think there's much. Gonna, like, I don't think it does anymore. It's, and, it's moved around so much. That's like, okay. <laughs> exactly. And like, I can't really start working on the next universe anyway. So there's going to be a gap between when they can even yeah. put out their next ones. I'm sure all the dates that they had, like tentatively for their next, the beginning of their DCU are going to be moved. So it, I guess it couldn't hurt to have something in between to mine that gap. So you, they may as well yeah. prioritize the other two. There's three releases in December. You're going to kill your chance That's at, true. You know, at making the most that you can at the box office that way. So, Well, dude, at this point, you might, you might be like 30 by the time Aquaman 2 comes out. Like, for real, though. Like, seriously. <laughs> it's been delayed how many times? Like two, three like, significant ones? Delays? It was, it was, it was, yeah. Some of them tied to COVID and then also tied to like just a lot. Just Warner Brothers being Warner Brothers issues and whatnot you know it was because they when this story when this story came out they did lump all three of those movies in the same story and i just remember being like ah dude no 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 and then they went and i got to aquaman and i was just like okay um (laughs) i guess if you if you must move it again i guess definitely move move it it'll be definitely be ending that universe on a whimper rather than a bang (laughs) and is it james Wan directing this one as well yeah, I feel uh, bad for him. I feel bad for him being wrapped up in that too. That sucks. I love yeah. James Wong. Um, another thing too, in regard to, I really hope they don't move it. I really hope, which is crazy. You know, instead of delaying your movies and costing yourself more money, it's just like just pay your actors fairly, your writers yeah. fairly, and you wouldn't be in this position right now. That's right. Um, but Dune is another example of you need your actors to promote it. In that case, you have a big sprawling ensemble cast that can promote it also has crazy international appeal. So you really want them to be able to be out there and promote it everywhere. Right. So it's important. Um, 
And sadly, even though they haven't announced this for like something like, let's say, like the Marvels or anything else that's coming out in like November, mm-hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon, we talked about like, you know, big Oscar movie with big stars that you would want to promote said movie. Don't put um, it up there. <laughs> I, I just would be surprised if we saw more delays. And you more wouldn't pushback. be surprised? No, I, no, no, no. Yeah. I really, I, um, really hope, but things are looking dismal, unfortunately, but time will ultimately I, tell. Yeah. I got the taste that it was going to happen when they when they delayed Challengers. I was like, all right, that co- that was coming out in September. That means that you don't think there's an end to this anytime soon. If you're if, if you're pushing a September release to next year, that like, does not well. <laughs> in the future, like even a few months from now, we might be looking at the Challengers delay as the first domino on yeah. these on these on this delay of the, the movie release calendar, which I'm really hoping we won't be, have to say. But you know that earner. Or- shareholders or whatnot are going to start speaking when their investments aren't turning a profit and when these massive corporations are churning out movies and when it's costing investors more and more I have a feeling that they'll fold first i still think that i really hope so i guess it really depend how steadfast the unions are and they're the ones with everything to i mean with the biggest stake in the game i suppose so i'm, I'm hoping that yeah they just you know stay steadfast but it's still early into this thing too, which is unfortunate. Like a lot of things could really go any sort of way in the next few months. Yeah. And, you know, I actually heard some, also, I want to break it down a little bit. Cause I've seen a lot of people say like, Oh, like actors and writers get paid so much. Like, why are they striking? Like, what's the big deal? Yes. There are, of course, the Brad Pitts and the Matt Damon's and the Sandra Bullock's and the Julie Roberts of the world who make a ton of money. That right. is true. But like most working day-to-day actors are not making that much money it's and like most thousand of them represented by the yeah. union they're not all a-listers right. and most writers i think i mentioned this before where writers said that you would be surprised that there are writers who have written for some of the most popular shows on tv and they can't even afford to pay the rent so that is what is out there like you're, we're doing it for the little guy it's not for like the rich should make more money. I mean, and I think that's why you, you see a lot of bigger actors in full support of it. Cause they're not, it's not about them. They're thinking more about, you know, the day-to-day actor who is not making what they're making. There are some people that think that bigger actors should be on the picket lines kind of representing. And I think there maybe is a good look to that, but I also, it can work both it, ways. It can, almost make, it can maybe be distracting, I guess, from you know, people who really need it, I guess. I agree. Um, so I see both I see both sides to that, but I really think I really think bigger actors are kind of doing more behind like I think I Tom Cruise apparently had like a big discussion with the studios about AI and 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 st- and stunt work as well, like getting those people fairly compensated. So I think actors like him, for instance, were having discussions behind the scenes that are helping. And I think that's the best thing that someone in his position or like a bigger performer can do. I, I really think seeing the face of like the normal everyday working actor alongside these normal everyday working writers is what you need to see. And I think that is more important than seeing a big star making a scene and making it like kind of like about them. About them. I um, completely agree. It's going to, yeah. if anything, soften and lose probably popular support to see. I know he's just a good example, but Brad Pitt or Leonardo DiCaprio on the picket line saying poor me i need right. to be compensated more i think that'll just do do worse for the cause and you're right it, it's going to come down to the little guy in this fight and the big dogs are most used best probably behind the scenes so and it seems to be that that's how things are going i've only seen a couple shots of any like meaningful like huge a-listers on the picket lines but it's good at least that they're showing support i mean it's you know because they are represented by that union and but uh yeah yeah they're still yeah, a long it, yeah it is this feels so similar to like, I mean, at least movie theaters are open and stuff like that, but it feels so similar to what the pandemic did to the industry. Cause yeah. I mean, it really, it really is like, it is a Hollywood shutdown. And like, we talked about this before where this puts so many people out of work. It's not just That's right. actor, actors and writers. It's every facet of the industry, you know, yeah. people providing costumes, props, catering, all that stuff. They're not working. And yeah. Uh, I, there was like some guy in LA, LA uh, that actually owns a prop store and like he's really nervous about it having to shut down right now because he nothing's coming in no money's coming in right. and this, this is the place that's been open for 
decades oh and he could, he could possibly lose it. And I think that's, that is important to hear and see too. I mean, it's, it's more so than like, you know, just the actors and writers. It really has this like domino effect to every yeah. aspect of the industry and it's costing the industry a ton of money. I mean, one of the writers on Twitter that I follow said it best. And I think I kind of brought this up to you when that story broke about how like, we'll just rate, we'll wait them out. You know, yeah. eventually they'll feel like they'll, they'll just starve and they don't have any money. They're going to want to come to the table and we'll just take what we give them. One of the writers I follow on Twitter was like, well, you know what? Most of us writers are used to being broke and most exec, most execs are not really used to losing a lot of money. That's so right. I think it's going to, I will be them that like once they have like their earnings call and like be like, oh shit, this is how much we're losing. That, that yeah, like there, there are a lot right. of broke, struggling writers and actors out there who are used to being broke it's and struggling. So, yeah. so it's yeah. nothing new. And like, and I think only I think putting that out that story out there, even though it was ugly and it was pretty vile, I think it also showed fire in these writers who who saw that that story and were like, "Oh, like this is what you think you're going to do right. to us," and it, and it only makes them kind of dig in their heels more. Like, no, we're not giving up, and you know, we're not we're, not, we're almost not going to be bullied into giving up because like to it really is an evil notion to say that to like be like, "Hey, like eventually they're going to." need us right because they have to live right and like it's it's so like it's almost it's almost cartoony in its villainy <laughs> oh, like, completely it just, it's like i feel like they're like dr evil from awesome powers yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? it's really like mustache yeah yeah <laughs> like oh, um it's but it's so like it's so and these are people in positions of power and money and like someone else made a good point too a lot of these people running things like a lot of these people are just businessmen, like CEOs and stuff. They're not really movie guys, right? Uh, like, so they run it like a business, and that is what's a touch of like a connection, a bigger, a greater connection to the industry is missing. Because like at the end of the day, these guys are just about the dollar bill and their bottom line, and That's that right. is kind of. And I think that is what you're really seeing uh, because of all this. And you know, I didn't really, maybe I wasn't too keenly aware i think it was a little bit different when the last one happened because we weren't in the streaming era and there was more at stake there was less at stake when that last writer strike happened right. um I, the streaming stuff kind of changed the game and it'll be interesting to see i think what we're kind of missing too and and i wonder if this will finally come out we've talked about like how with residuals when it comes to like the streaming stuff the studios and stuff and you know, people that run like all these platforms are like, well, you know, it's kind of a new business model. We can't really determine how to kind of pay you guys out based on streaming hours. And a lot of these writers are like, I think the first thing that needs to happen is that you need to be, whether it's good or bad, more transparent with how these things are doing, like numbers wise. Right. And the, it is really strange still how secretive they are about the exact figures and exact numbers. You and like, like I said, we've talked about before where they're, they're bragging, like, oh, yeah, this is our most watched show in like the first seven days. Or, like, oh, like, what were the numbers? Like, no, just the most watched. Trust exactly. us. Just, yeah, <laughs> You're right. And, and I, I wonder if there was transparency, would we find that like some of these things aren't doing as well as we think they are? I or, like, well, certainly. That's at least the impression that I'm left with. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would hope if one of the things that comes out of this is that they'll be forced to be transparent about some of these figures because i think that you will have to be if you're talking about like okay what should they fairly make from residuals from a streaming program then you're gonna have to really provide okay concrete it's, data <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah and and they can no longer be the gatekeepers to it because you know they have to like share that um yeah which is just another i think another reason for them to dig in their heels when when demands like that like transparency on streaming data is kind of at stake there's even more of i guess pressure on those striking right now because the, the fate of the industry and the future of the industry is really in their hands like the longer they hold out and the more pressured the studios are to make concessions to stuff decisions like that that's only going to benefit yeah. people in the future so it's not it's far beyond just them being paid adequately although that is a huge factor and like you know the 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 threats from what ai will do to their compensation in the future but there's things like the streaming data all that is 
something that they got to fight for too. And if the sooner they give out and the less kind of, uh, I guess, leg to stand on that they have to pressure the studios into that sort of deal, the worse it's going to be for them in the future. And they're just going to be back on the picket lines whenever the contract's up the next time fighting for the same or even different issues. So yeah, there's, yeah, there's just a lot at stake and it's the, really the, the powers in their hands if they can hold out, which of course, yeah. you know, we're all hoping they, we don't want to see it go on any longer, but when it's this sort of thing at stake, you kind of do want to see it go to the bitter end and have the studios crumble. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, brought up the whole delays with the movies that are potential delays. We have when we one official one with challengers and then a potential one with doom part two color purple and Aquaman. But there are other movies that are, were filming that have set release dates, but now that they're not filming, those set release dates are now in question. So you had something like Deadpool three was in the middle of filming. Right. That's that's completely shut down. Beetlejuice was in the middle of filming. Right. Completely shut down. Don't remind um, me of all these projects. It's gonna be like disappointing. No, no, I'm, I'll, so I'll, I'll make you feel. I'll make you feel better. Your little House of the Dragon, though, still yes. find a way to shoot. <laughs> Thank God. Yes. Because I guess there's different kind of union like kind of laws in where they shoot in I guess London and stuff. So they were able right. to still film. They actually were able to do that. I think they actually had their scripts completed nice. ahead of the writer's strike. So. You dodge that bullet and you're going to dodge another. Uh, I've been real lucky with that. Show. All the fans. Yeah. yeah. Things have been going well for that. So I'm hoping that luck doesn't run out. I heard that Wicked only had 10 days left of filming when they shut no. them down. Oh. So, and yeah, I mean, like, it, it really is like complete. Like, you know, in the case of the writers, when that writer strike happens, it was like, all right, pins down, mm. laptops off. Now the actors are in, like, nothing's shooting can't do anything without your talent so uh, there's that i just really hope i mean i just know well, knowing what we know from like a lot of these guys i don't i think they are just gonna try to be greedy and ride this out mm -hmm. and it's un it's unfortunate well they yeah. have our support from back to the blockbuster and our, our listeners i'm sure so hopefully they can that will carry them across the finish line but i'm sure we will be covering this for a lot longer so yeah i think so too and you know what I saw some writers on Twitter and stuff who actually, you know, like in my position, like write about movies for a living, mm -hmm. uh, wondering if they were reviewing a movie. Does that kind of count as like not supporting actors if you're like reviewing a project and getting paid for it? You know, if you work for a publication and you're getting paid to cover movies, you're not being paid by the studio. You're being paid by your publication to do a job. Mm -hmm. and that And that job is protected in that. You can still... Because who's to say that if you go and review something that you're going to like it? So it's not like, you sure. know, it could be it could be negative. So, you know, there are some content creators and influencers who are in a different position because some of those guys also eventually want to become actors and actresses. Right. And and a lot of content creators and influencers, they do get kickbacks from the studio like, hey, we'll give you this swag bag if you say something really positive about our movie. They can't take that stuff right now because SAG is like, hey, if you ever want to be in this in the future and we find out that you're kind of promoting stuff in that kind of way, mm -hmm. then they won't let them be members. So right. it's a very kind of fine line, I guess. But, you know, I, any writers listening who like might feel like, oh, like I feel like I'm if I'm reviewing a movie or something for my trade that it's in some way showing that not in support of that it's not that you're being paid to do a job and and you're of course you're not being paid by a, a studio or network to cover it like you're a journalist so that's your job uh you know like i fully support the actors and writers um you know it's interesting because i know i i saw like i know ty and i think you too right like cancel like some of their uh yeah streaming absolutely. stuff absolutely uh i don't pay for that but yeah no that's like uh, certainly uh, I, I mean, and I don't feel bad about it. Well, yeah, I mean, and that it's, you know, in covering this, it's not like promoting anything. We're not really trying to uh, promote things one way or the other. We're just trying That's to just right. covering the news as we kind of see it. And, but yeah, I think we made it pretty clear from the start of this, like with first where the writers and now the actors, <laughs> where we stand on this. Absolutely. Um, it's pretty clear. And I know kind of, I know like, We've been kind of a little tongue in cheek joking, like, oh, like it's gonna, you know, push you some of our these movies that we were looking forward to. Yeah, we are having a little fun and like, oh, we we're sad for that. But I mean, it's still 
it's not pleasant either. Like we want to be covering like really positive, fun kind of news <laughs> regarding the industry. Absolutely. Uh, this isn't doing any and, good for us either. Yeah. You know, I think you'll, you know, I've seen some podcasts who like, you know, who are like, Hey, like their thing is to kind of cover the new movie every week. Right. And they're like, right. they are like, they're like, if we have to, we'll pivot and we'll change and we'll, there'll be a lot of throwbacks and like stuff like that. You know, like they're like, we can, you know, in support of like, you know, of what they're fighting for other people are trying to pivot and like handle things, you know, respectively in their own way. And, and hopefully people listening think that we've handled it respectively and covered it uh, respectively as well. And even though it's not the most pleasant part of the industry, we will continue to update you guys on what's going on. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be ending anytime soon, but mm. we'll be along for the ride though. We'll be along for the ride. Uh, but yeah, fucking greedy CEOs, man. It's crazy. I, <laughs> So out of touch with all their money and they're super young. <laughs> it makes you really hard to, for anybody to really support them. That's for sure. I'm sure many people don't. So they can't have too many people yeah. in their corner, but they'll wake up eventually, you know, especially like yeah. you said, when the earning call, earnings calls come. But yeah. um, well, <laughs> speaking of movies that may or may not be coming out, there are some, we do have trailers, which was, this was a weird, I kind of felt, by the way, Comic-Con was this weekend. And as you know, a lot of the actors couldn't go to promote their movies because that's part of the the rules when you're striking within the union. So they couldn't attend Comic Con. There was some stuff that was released for the Marvels that you could tell that was probably maybe going to be like they were going to be represented there, right? Had there had there been no strike, uh, which is why I thought it was strange that this Marvel trailer got dropped in the middle of the night. I, I got home sure. from seeing Barbie and. and it I came out at like 11 30 at my time. <laughs> 11 30, 11 30 at night my time. Uh and I was like, well, that's really weird to drop like a trailer for a big tin pole release, but whatever. <laughs> um what'd you think of the trailer? I don't um I, I... <laughs> not much to be honest. It didn't it didn't improve upon anything I'd seen in the first one. If anything, like I'll say it didn't look any worse, but my bar was already quite low. So that's not really saying a whole lot from my perspective, but just to reiterate, like this was not going to be, I don't think anything I was going to go out of my way to see in the first place. Definitely not at my alley. So take that, take yeah. my opinion of it, you know, how you will. Um, I don't really have a lot of confidence in this movie. What did you think? <laughs> There's not much more I can say to tell you the truth. But no, I thought, shitting on it. I thought the first tra- trailer was better. Okay. Than this one, because at least the first trailer made it look like, oh, this is gonna be kind of fun, a little different from the other one. Doesn't Certainly. look like it doesn't look like it's taking itself too seriously. I don't know. There was like it's just crazy because you know, I coming off of Guardians of the Galaxy in Volume Three, which I thought was really good, which I was like, okay, that this is how good Marvel can be when they're really good. Uh, right. watch, watching this trailer, I feel like it was like a, we're dialing it back, yes, a little bit right. to like how I you know how I felt with like Ant Man and the Lost Quantum Media or something like that, where it's like, oh, like almost back to basics and not in a good way. I feel bad because I feel like the Marvel is going to get shit on in its own regard. It, everyone knows why we've talked about it. Yep. Yeah, we'll, just, we'll just call it the Brie Larson effect. Um, I, I'm trying not to show it too hard. It just didn't look like anything that really, I don't know, nothing really grabbed me from it. I mean, the three leads look fun and like they look, seem like they're having a good time and like I like that, but like nothing about it made it feel like a must see. I, I don't think they've done a good job setting up who or who their villain is and what the motivations are. I don't think really like yeah. the stakes of, of them, they're having their powers manipulated and switching bodies every time they use it just does not sound like that. It just kind of sounds like something that I would expect out of like one of the like comedy driven MCU shows more than the big catalysts and the issue at hand for, for, a, you know, the sequel to one of their, bigger tentpole releases it doesn't seem like the stakes are really there in this one granted i mean it is a trailer it's not going to tell us everything but uh, i really have no idea what sort of movie this one is trying to be i i don't really get the sense i do very much feel that brie larson is sidelined in this movie and i feel like that's a reaction to some of the yeah. the hate her character and her performance had from the first one although people you know like it i think that they are marvel in this case is really appealing to those that had problems with captain marvel and are making sure like, she's not very much the vehicle driving this 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 movie i feel like i see that in her performance at least in some clips from the from because, the trailer but well, uh she seems like a supporting player in her own yeah, sequel which exactly. is like 
which um, is kind of how I, I felt mean, with Indy in his movie, like same sort of effect. Right. And there's nothing wrong with sharing the wealth, of course, but like it right. really feels like, like they're like, hey, it's a Captain Marvel sequel, but we're kind of disguising it as something else. That's what it kind of feels like uh, a little bit. And I haven't watched Secret Invasion. I get the impression from that trailer that I probably should be watching it to fully understand where we're going to be at when right. we get the Marvels. And that is another Marvel problem that I don't really love where it's like, oh, I have to be watching that TV show to feel like I'm up to speed by the too time true, this movie comes too out. True. And a lot of people have complained about that. Also, this, anybody that's like mid into Secret Invasion right now is kind of having sp- massive spoilers by the release of these trailers. Like it's kind of takes away all the tension. <laughs> if there was any, yeah, begin with. I haven't heard anything good about Secret Invasion just from the people that I follow that have been posting about it. But if you had any sort of like, you know, interest in seeing what's going to happen to Nick Fury by the end of Secret Invasion, you can pretty much rest assured knowing he'll be fine if he's appearing in this next outing yeah. in a few months. So just like poor, I, I feel like they don't care, right? At least they're caring much less than they had. I think like phase four really detracted and phase five and everything, all the delays that they're facing, the Jonathan Majors issues, everything going against yeah. Marvel right now is, I feel like it's culminating in this movie where they really don't know where to turn to next. Yeah, I agree. And also still strange to drop it in the middle of the night. I mean, it's supposed to be like a big movie. I was, I was like <laughs> random. I was like, was this a mistake? Did someone like send it too early <laughs> or late? I don't know. <laughs> like, what does that say? Um, the confidence they have. Uh, yeah. movie, right? Like you don't drop a picture like that in the middle of the night <laughs> while everyone's asleep. <laughs> so odd. But yeah, if you're interested in the Marvels, will be out on the 10th. And I guess quickly, the last trailer I'm just going to discuss for a second uh, I actually saw this trailer online first, and then when I saw Barbie, I actually saw yeah. it ahead ahead of nice. Barbie. It, that seemed it, appropriate. The, the trailer for Wonka played much better in that, like on the big screen. Okay, it looks it looks absolutely fucking whimsical. I, kind of all in. I don't know. <laughs> it looks it's a pretty good. good. Word, the one I was looking for that I could not figure out how I wanted to describe this movie, but I will say I'm a little conflicted as to what I think the tone of this movie is trying to be. That's not necessarily criticism and I'll make my mind up when it comes out, but you know, like there's this whole like discourse about like from the earlier, like Gene, is it Gene Wilder that played? Yeah. 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 There's like kind of like a sinister presence to his Willy Wonka in the earlier ones, even though it is kind of a whimsical fun family movie, there's like darker themes in that other yeah. one and i feel like we had glimpses of that here but it overall feels very much like a younger audience oriented like kind of the magic that because it's from the director paddington which is like universally loved yeah. but still like you know much more lighter in tone and theme and i feel like this movie is yeah. skewing that way while sort of kind of giving you a peek behind the curtain of some of the more like radical weirder side of wonka that i feel like it's kind of battling right now but in any case so the trailer is yeah. very interesting looks like it'll be a lot of fun we it does look like that's a, that was the one thing I was gonna ask you that too. Okay. I, I, you too. I, I think he is probably him and Florence Pugh like feel like they're like some of the best actors of their generation, like in their mm, little kind of age, age group. Uh, and to me, this was like another example of like the guy has like seems like he has like incredible range and can do anything. I mean, mm-hmm. I it I'm intrigued by it. I do get a lot of people this was a trailer that when it premiered online it felt like very split the reaction where it was like okay people yeah. who felt like you people who felt like you in a sense of like i wish they wouldn't i wish they wouldn't shy away from the fact that that character and that story is kind of dark ish right and uh and some people were like they made it the and this is supposed to be like a direct prequel to that so it's just like this feels a little bit more like oh he's such a good guy and it's light and it's like you know he's fun and like Right. They didn't really love that. But then there are other people like me that like saw the trailer. And I was like, I, I just looks completely engaging. I, I mean, I like the music in it seems really good and fun. I and like, it looks engaging. I'll, I'll agree with that for sure. Um, I know. Usually, usually I'm not really sold on movies like that. But I, like, when I first saw the trailer, I was like, it made me feel like a, a little kid again for like, I was yeah. like, oh, this looks like it could be, could be fun. Uh, and yeah. what did you, what did you think of Shalami though? I mean, from the clips in the trailer different than anything I, I think that he's worked on yet i will say is like i'm excited for him to kind of disappear into this role i can't help but feel like i can i don't think he's quite been you know enveloped by the character i can tell that's timothy chalamet but i'll save right. you know reserve any like sort of analysis until i see more of his performance but i think this will be a good step in the direction in terms of like expanding his catalog of you know the kind of roles that he's right. 
able to take on. So I think it's an interesting step in that direction for him. And cause he's kind of played, you know, well, you know, he's been diverse so far, but he's, yeah. I think going to great lengths, not to get himself typecast. And I appreciate that out of him. I love Timothy Chalamet uh, and I would love to see him in this. I'm excited to see where he takes the role, Yeah, but I'm hoping like I want them to lean into more of like the darker stuff. I guess I would be happier if we see a little bit of that, but time will tell. In any case, I think it does look compelling. It, Looks like it'll. I think Christmas time is a perfect time to release a movie. Yeah, like this. That's a, and should think, things go should things go the way they should, and they release yeah. it on that date, <laughs> December fifteenth is when it comes out. It feels like the perfect kind of movie for that time of year. Certainly. <laughs> um, so prime release day if they can keep it. But yeah, I see it being a big hit if it really hits with families and stuff too. I you know, and it does you know, it does feel like it's from the director of Paddington. It feels very much like I was like oh, I was like that doesn't surprise me. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think the two trailers that I'm discussing, I actually interested in seeing it more so than the Marvels Certainly, um, at I the agree. moment. Um, but yeah, I guess we shall see when it comes out on December 15th. Hopefully, uh, we'll see. Oh, hopefully, 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 yeah. hopefully crossing yeah. fingers. <laughs> One thing that's not going to get delayed, though, is this week's box office prediction, which is a movie that I'm very much looking forward to since that first trailer, an A24 horror, no less, which I don't think we've really covered anything like that box office no. wise since we've been you know doing this so australian indie horror movie put up by a24 talk to me comes out this weekend in terms of prediction do you have any numbers that will influence this guess or comparing this to well to compare it i'm going to use other a24 horror movies as i guess a good example I mean, it might be good to kind of compare it to something like hereditary which had really great right. reviews at a release and then uh also, maybe Midsommar might be a good one too, both yeah. by Ari Aster, but still eight by A24. Uh, right now, Talk to Me has a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is great. The buzz on the movie is like super good. Yeah. Uh, apparently, apparently, there is no fat in this movie. They said this is a very lean, okay. scary, like as from start to finish kind of thing, which uh, which is good. Uh, you know, Hereditary, when it opened June 7th, 2018, opened to 13.5 million. Uh, and it had legs. It carried that to forty-four million dollars domestic and eighty-two point eight million worldwide. In a similar position as Talk to Me, where you know really good reviewed horror film. And then uh, Midsummer, which I think might be a, another good one to compare it to, had an opening. I think it was in the million dollar range. I'm just gonna look it up real quick. Oh wow, lighter than I expected. I guess sure. I didn't realize how small those movies were when they were coming out. Yeah, because I'm oh, a huge actually, fan I, of them. Yeah. Open this actually six point five million dollars in its opening weekend, eight twenty twenty seven point four million domestic and forty eight million dollars worldwide. I think those two are good. I comparisons, so it's like hereditary, of course, opened a bit bigger. But um, let's see. Well, I had higher ambitions I, for this movie, but comparing it to those, like I think I'm going to drop it down just for the sake of conservation. But I want to go with a nice. I'm going to go with like a twenty. Because we haven't had a good horror release. It could kind of be really the kickoff to kind of an early start to spooky season. I know August, late August, September kind of is like the official. But this could be, you know, we'll see if audiences are really ready to go all in on horror. We've had a summer full of blockbuster releases. So I'm expecting people are going to show up a little bit to this. Although, but it doesn't have, you know, the superstardom of Ari Aster or like a, an acclaimed director behind it. I think it's the first feature for the two for the duo that's making this. But anyway, I'm gonna go with a confident twenty. Okay, I love your I love your horror movie confidence. <laughs> it's got good buzz. That's another thing. Ninety six Rotten Tomatoes. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna come down a little lower than you, only because yep. I want I I wonder if the buzz and ground cell is like just within like the horror community and not like you know mm. how it feels like oh it feels like everyone's talking about this right. and then you kind of realize like oh wait no it was just us. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hope not. Um, I'm gonna go with 14. Okay, a little more pragmatic. We'll see. Yeah. I'm really excited to uh, see how this does over the weekend. I think it's coming to my theater. We kind of miss stuff like this sometimes as being in a smaller town. But if it's there, I'm gonna be seeing it for sure. But I guess I do got to fit in two other. Well, I gotta get Barbie and a rewatch of Oppenheimer in. So I might be living at the at the the box office this weekend. We'll see though. Yep. Uh, yep. All right. Well, hopefully. I mean, either way though. I mean. Imagine the budget on this movie is not huge, so I mean, either True. It's opening gonna... week, either, either opening weekend would be great. Um, and uh, and you're right, or does tend to work, you know, as we've seen time and time again. So uh, yeah, 
I I think we could. Yeah. This I is hope one that any lower. Yeah, <laughs> anybody that kind of interested or if you're just hearing about this movie go watch the trailer and tell me it doesn't scare the socks off you i think this looks like oh uh, yeah to be one of the scarier movies in recent memory i think it's just got a great plot to it and really excited to see where it goes and really excited to get my you know to get spooked out in the theater again because that is not something that happens very often with me so the last thing that really spooked me out was earlier this year was skin of a rink and even that i kind of had my yeah it didn't scare the crap out of me but a couple tent scenes for sure but I'm expecting this one to to really go all out. So yeah. I hope it doesn't let justice for justice for Skinner Marine. <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I know we covered a lot today, uh, but I think we got a lot of stuff in. And I know we missed a news week last week, but we have to let that Dark Knight episode breathe because you know that's, that's right. an important movie. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, we got you guys all caught up with uh, some of the stuff that's been going on and. I'm glad that we started the episode celebrating a big, like I said, big box office win for right. two really good movies. Uh, that will be the biggest takeaway, I think, for me for this episode was like seeing how, like you said, the internet actually did something good this time. It <laughs> made these two movies, they made these two movies very successful and kind of just going to focus on that, like to having two really well reviewed movies that absolutely killed it at the box office this weekend. Agreed. It was nice uh, to start off on not a dismal note for once. Yeah. Yes, yeah. for sure. All right, buddy. All right, um, buddy. Let's wrap us on up. Yeah, just on that note, though, guys, if you haven't seen our latest episode, 109, where we were talking about the 15th anniversary of The Dark Knight, feel free to go do that. You can find it wherever we release our episodes. And we had a lot of guests on that episode, which made for some great discussion. It was uh, fantastic to talk about that movie. But this has been episode 110 of Back to the Blockbuster. Thank you so much for joining us again as we caught you guys up on some industry-wide news. It's not always positive, but it's a blast to talk about it with you, especially Gaius. So Thank you for joining us, guys. Remember, tell your friends that you guys can stream us wherever you guys get your podcasts, especially on the newly released playlist app. Go check it out. Check us out over there. And wherever you guys get your social media, you can find us at Back to the Blockbuster at that handle on any app. And we appreciate your support as always, guys. Feel free to reach out to us throughout the week. We'll have some more content headed your way. And until then, Gaius, it's been a pleasure. You always sell that well, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Take care, my friends. Peace out, guys.